There we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the League of Women Voters of Maine's discussion series on digital threats to democracy. Today, we're going to be talking about combating extremism in the digital world um, with our guest, Brian Hughes, who I'll introduce in a minute um, and then turn it over to him. Um, this is pretty casual. So as we go, um, he has a brief presentation and then we're gonna open it up to questions. So if people think of anything while he's talking, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we can try to get to as many as we can within the hour. Um, and if you have any technical questions, feel free to chat me. Um, I'm Lane Sturdivant and I'm an organizer for the League of Women Voters of Maine. And as I said, Brian Hughes is our guest. Um, and so, um, this is, maybe someone can interject and help me here, maybe the third or fourth of our discussion series on um, digital threats to democracy. And we're really excited to have Brian here to talk about um, extremism um, in the digital world. Um, so Brian is a research assistant professor in the program of justice, law, and criminology at American University. Dr. Hughes is a Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation entrepreneur. He is also the co-founder and associate director of the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, PERIL, where he develops um, studies and interventions to reduce the risk of radicalization to extremism. So thanks for coming to talk with us, Brian. Thanks, Lane. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me um, and thank you all uh, for, for coming out. Um, I, I do have a presentation that I hope will uh, help to frame our discussion here. I'll try not to um, ramble on uh, because I really do want to um, speak with you all, answer your questions and have a real conversation about this. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, it would, um, let's just, Oh, you know what, Lane? I don't, oh, here we go. Here's my share screen. I'm going to, there we are. Can you all see my slides there? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's in order to get this conversation off uh, on, on uh, a good footing, I'm going to outline uh, some of the challenges and some of the problems that we're encountering uh, as we look at polarization and extremism, um, uh, especially online. Uh, my work in the lab actually tends to focus in the online space, but we also do work uh, in higher ed. We do work with international organizations, public health groups. Uh, there's a real whole of society approach that's needed to address this problem. Um, and increasingly, and this is something we can talk about uh, later on, increasingly we're finding that strengthening democracy and building resilient communities uh, are really the most effective and wide reaching solutions to this problem of radicalization. Uh, over the years, as we've been uh, addressing uh, this problem of extremism, we've really reached the conclusion that this isn't something that we can arrest or surveil our way out of. This really has to do with strengthening the social cohesion of our society. Uh, but before I get ahead of myself, uh, let me just take a second to, to define what is extremism. We use a pretty simple definition. Um, we, we try not to uh, attach our definition of extremism to what is legal or what is illegal or what is considered centrist or not because those are shifting um, standards. You know, there have been um, regimes throughout history uh, that um, enacted extremist policies that were completely legal. So the way that we define extremism is um, the division of society into uh, sharp in-group or out-group uh, distinctions. So there's, oops, there's the people who uh, are the uh, elect, and then the people who are um, on the outs. And uh, this distinction is almost always along lines of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, uh, and political identity. And what uh, extremism says is that uh, these groups 
because of their identity differences and because one is the in-group and the other is the out-group, these are in uh, irresolvable conflict. Uh, they can't get along. They can't uh, come together across their differences. Uh, they can't even coexist in spite of their differences. Uh, there's an irresolvable conflict that can only be solved through separation, domination, or extreme violence. Either you have to um, uh, deport uh, or um, uh, brutally subjugate, or in the worst case, uh, genocide um, the, the people in the group uh, that, um, that you are in this conflict with. Um, now, there are all kinds of corollary dynamics uh, that go into extremism, um, but th there's one that I really do want to uh, point out because it's an increasing concern. It's what we call moral disengagement. Now, moral disengagement is um, this process whereby you begin to believe that the ordinary moral considerations that you would extend to your neighbor or anyone in your community begin to no longer apply. Uh, that person is no longer worthy of moral consideration. And maybe that means they're no longer worthy of being politically enfranchised. Or maybe that means they're no longer worthy uh, of living in the same area as you. Or maybe it means they're no longer worthy of being alive. Uh, so as extremism gets more extreme, moral disengagement becomes a more pressing problem and it moves uh, in this progressively worse direction uh, towards these uh, false solutions of separation, domination, and violence. Um, and uh, nowadays, uh, with the arrival and the explosion and um, entrenchment of digital media, um, we're seeing that extremism uh, is changing in certain ways. Um, the extremism of the digital age uh, in some ways is very different from the extremism of uh, the days of broadcast and print. Uh, but in other ways, uh, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Uh, the way that we like to think of extremism and radicalization, we like to uh, put it into a supply and demand model where uh, on the one hand, you have the reasons why people are attracted to extremism, uh, the reasons why they look to conspiracy theories uh, or the reasons why they look to a scapegoat. Um, and we call that the demand side of things. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have the supply side, which is the extremist groups who are providing propaganda. They're providing uh, cultural content in the form of music or images um, or uh, recruitment in-person gatherings and so on. Um, and in this age of digital media, uh, what we're finding is that uh, the issues that pertain to demand are largely the same as they were before the internet, but the issues of supply have been drastically altered um, as a result of digital communication technology. So on the one hand, we can think of demand uh, as pertaining to the grievances and the vulnerabilities that make a person susceptible uh, to radicalization. So uh, we know that uh, people who are radicalized uh, to violent extremism tend to have a very high um, adverse childhood experiences uh, scores. Uh, that is to say, in, in you know, less clinical language, uh, they've typically suffered a lot of trauma as children. Um, when this trauma gets uh, linked to a grievance, say they decide to blame um, uh, this religious group or this racial group for their problems, then that makes them highly vulnerable to radicalization. Um, but, but the issue then is that in order for those vulnerabilities uh, to begin a radicalization process, they have to come in contact with that supply side. They have to come into contact with the cultural and the ideological materials that will take those grievances uh, and take that trauma and all the maladaptive behaviors and negative feelings that are associated with it and channel it in a political direction. Now, uh, those vulnerabilities can actually lead people in a number of antisocial directions. Um, a person who has um, a lot of childhood trauma um, may join a gang or they may get involved with abusive relationships, or they may, be, they may become substance abusers. 
Um, so they really have to come into contact with um, compelling uh, examples of extremist materials or extremist recruiters who can take those vulnerabilities and, and fill them uh, with this radicalizing material, which can uh, begin them down this pathway. It's kind of a simplified way of, of looking at it, but it's basically true. So what's happened now uh, is that with the internet, the availability of this radicalizing material has just vastly uh, um, expanded. You know, in, in the 20th century, before the internet, a person who had these vulnerabilities would have had to get very lucky or very unlucky uh, to meet, say, a neo-Nazi skinhead in their hometown who could recognize that this was a troubled youth and channel um, that the, the, those problems towards this racist, anti-Semitic worldview. And then that young person would have to go back to the bar or the concert where they met um, the recruiter, they'd have to go to this or that rally. And it was really a more um, time intensive uh, process that required a lot more agency and initiative on the part of the person who was being radicalized. Well, nowadays, uh, anytime you log onto your computer, um, you are flooded with radicalizing material. Uh, this is particularly true in the spaces where youth congregate, like uh, gaming chats or social media. Um, it's unavoidable. Uh, it's a real problem for ordinary users who aren't vulnerable that we're coming into contact with all of this. It makes our experience of spending time online or using online tools uh, extremely unpleasant sometimes. So uh, what we see is a, a real difference in kind in terms of the uh, reach and the volume of radicalizing material. Uh, the way that the internet works, um, a, any, any um, document, any film, any video clip uh, can be reproduced almost instantaneously uh, for almost zero cost. This is why uh, you have an event, unfortunately, like the Christchurch uh, mosque shooting, uh, which was originally uh, live streamed online to a relatively small number of people. Uh, it was um, shut down um, not too long into it. And yet um, at this point, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of copies of that video are proliferated online. Um, you can't stamp it out, it's impossible. Uh, so the content, um, there's more of it, it moves faster and it's able to survive a lot longer. Um, and then there, there's a fourth um, element that uh, doesn't get taken into account, I think often enough. And that's the effect of the internet and digital media on victim survivors and on the uh, vulnerable groups that are targeted by extremists. Uh, you know, I, I gave a talk uh, at a middle school about a year ago. Um, and this was a middle school with a very diverse student population. And um, there was a, uh, uh, an African-American boy uh, who uh, spoke up and he told us his story uh, where he said, um, there are games that I want to play online. There are video games that all my white friends can play, but I can't play it because as soon as I log on, I just hear racial slurs left and right. And um, that's terrible. I, I can't, you know, emotionally, that's an awful way uh, to spend your time. And if you have ever heard a child say that they can't play where they want to um, online or off, that's a really heartbreaking thing to hear. So these same characteristics of volume and speed and the survival uh, of this propaganda and these radicalizing messages, it not only um, reaches potentially radicalizing individuals more easily, it also reaches victims more easily. So that's something that um, you know, we just have to always keep in mind, I think. Uh, now, along with this comes serious threats to democracy. Uh, in addition to um, these uh, dynamics that relate to content that I just described, there are also a lot of dynamics that are unique to digital media that shape the way that we uh, gather together socially both online and off, 
and the way that those um, social groups that we form affect the way that we behave uh, and even the way we think and the things that we believe. Um, you know, one of the things that's so great about the internet is that it permits us uh, to stay in contact with people uh, we would otherwise have lost contact with. And it allows us to reach out and connect with people who we otherwise never would have met. People with very obscure hobbies are able to connect and form these wonderful communities where uh, they, can, they can share their passion for, you, you name it, underwater basket weaving, I don't know. But the, the, the flip side of this is that uh, it is very easy for um, extremely destructive and harmful groups to connect with one another and to connect with, um, for lack of a better term, normal people. Um, we see this in the private chats of these extremist groups. They talk and they strategize and they plan how they will enter into um, a local Facebook group. Say there's a, a Facebook group for the local rifle club. Um, Anti-government extremists will uh, meet on their private uh, Telegram chat and they'll say, okay, this is how we're going to go in and this is how we're going to wake those people up. We're going to start off by talking um, very reasonably um, about uh, gun rights. And then we're going to slowly move them into uh, this idea that the government is going to come and take your guns. And then from there, we're going to move them into understanding that it's actually the Jews uh, controlling the government to come and take your guns. Um, so this is a real thing that happens. It's happening every day. Um, and um, But what's interesting is that as a result of this more um, uh, eclectic, um, easy connection that happens, there's a little bit less ideological rigidity. So back in the old days, um, a lot of militias and a lot of white supremacist groups would never mix. They didn't like each other. Um, their leaders viewed uh, one another as competitors. Well, with this easy connection that the internet gives us, that's really no longer the case. Um, people might not even belong to one extremist group or another. They'll just be loosely affiliated with a few of them. Um, and increasingly, that's happening with so-called average everyday people. They don't have to go out and join the militia. Uh, they can just visit the militia's webpage every now and then uh, and pick up uh, some new ideas. They don't have to drive out to the rally in the woods. Uh, they, can, they can pick and choose and get their toes wet without having to make the commitment um, that really stood as a barrier in those days before the internet. Um, so what we see uh, is mobilizing concepts. Instead of ideologies and leaders that are um, laying out you know, 12 point programs to establish uh, a pure white America, what we're seeing is big vague ideas that are capable of energizing a lot of these different eclectic groups and the people who float between them. Uh, Stop the Steal, uh, which led to January 6th, is really a prime example of that. Um, the stop the steal um, uh, narrative was something that everyone from the white supremacists to the militias to the rank and file voters um, could grab onto and it mobilized them to come to Washington DC. And you know there are a lot of complicated dynamics there, um, but we all know ultimately what the consequence of that was. And then finally, uh, we have this, this problem of mis- and disinformation. Um, extremism is based, and it's built on mis- and disinformation. It's built on false narratives uh, about uh, why there are problems in the world, who or what is to blame for those problems, and uh, what we ought to do to solve those problems. Um, and uh, the, the, the problem of mis- and disinformation online is, it's huge <laughs> and, and there are a million different directions we can go in. I would love to talk with uh, you all more about it, but I'll, I'll let you all uh, guide that part of the conversation just because there are so many different ways uh, that we could go. And it, it just, it, it almost doesn't need to be said that this isn't just a threat to um, our federal government. Um, this is really a threat uh, to our communities at the most um, fundamental level. Our social institutions, um, from our churches to our schools, uh, to our families, 
uh, are being torn apart uh, by the things that are happening as a result of extremism. Uh, trauma and fear uh, are pervasive. Um, people fear political violence. Um, people who belong to targeted groups um, understand that they are members of targeted groups. And this actually has measurable medical outcomes, negative medical outcomes. Um, we're subject to greater securitization and surveillance as a result of this. I don't think anyone loves the idea of living in a world um, where uh, we need that, um, but uh, it, is, it is increasingly a necessity because of this threat of violence, um, because um, this, this churn of negative um, associations online spills out over into violence uh, with such regularity. So that's the bad news. Um, but hopefully now I can I can get into some of the good news. You know, at, at Peril, um, we're really working to try um, to uh, to address these problems, not in a reactive way, um, not in a way that's just responding to the problems as they occur, but in a way that uh, really tries to address the root of them and tries to build a more healthy resilient society and democracy. Um, so real quick to tell you about Peril, it stands for the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab. Um, we're an applied research lab. We're housed within a, in, a, a university institution. Um, that means that there are certain expectations that are placed on us. Um, all of our work has to be empirical. All of it has to be evidence-based. Uh, all of it has to be tested before, during, and after, uh, both for um, effects, in other words, to see if it works, but also for blowback, to make sure that um, it does no harm. We operate on a do no harm principle, um, and we have an institutional review board that um, ethically reviews every single uh, study or intervention that we do to make sure uh, that we're doing that. Um, so we use scholarly methods, scholarly ethics, Everything we do um, is ultimately published. We have an obligation uh, to return evidence to the field and to expand the body of knowledge uh, in this area. Um, as I said, we're, we're really working towards prevention. Uh, there are a lot of folks doing great work on the security side of things. Um, and that's absolutely necessary as we see. We need good law enforcement. We need good security to address the threats of violence that, that are, are imminent. But that's ultimately only a Band-Aid solution. And that's really all it can ever be is a Band-Aid solution. Um, in order to uh, see to it that we have fewer of these problems uh, in the first place, we've found uh, that we really need to be focusing on community resilience and strengthening democracy. Um, and as a part of all of this, we really make a point um, to keep our work victim and survivor centered. Um, almost all of our interventions include some component of gathering the experiences or getting feedback that reflects the needs of victim survivors, um, because ultimately these are the people who are the uh, most and worst affected by extremism uh, and extremist violence. And, and again, as necessary and as important as that securitized side can be, um, that side really has very little to offer victim survivors uh, beyond the, the justice that comes with, with catching and punishing uh, a perpetrator. Um, one of the most promising uh, areas that we've been working on is, is what's called attitudinal inoculation. Sometimes it's called pre-bunking, uh, especially since uh, the term inoculation has become uh, such a political hot potato. Um, so I'll just tell you real quick what inoculation is. It's a form of preventative communication. Uh, it's really a hybrid of media literacy and counter-propaganda education. And, and what's wonderful about it is that it doesn't tell people what to believe. Um, it's not about trying to turn uh, Republicans into Democrats uh, or um, progressives into centrists. Uh, or trying to convert uh, Muslims to um, agnostics, you name it. What it's about, it's about empowering um, the public to recognize the strategies of manipulative uh, messages, the red flags that tell you 
hey, um, this uh, bit of media that you're consuming uh, is appealing to your emotions, it's trying to hijack your um, ability to reason, and it's trying to get you to believe something that isn't necessarily in your best interest, um, not in your best moral interest, and maybe not in your best material interest. So what we do is we, we make these uh, videos, and um, the videos basically say exactly what I just told you, but then they give some examples uh, of these manipulative strategies and explain how they work, um, and, and that's that. And we have really excellent evidence showing that in as little as 30 seconds, you can um, get people to uh, trust manipulative information less, uh, you can get them to support the purveyors of manipulative information less, and um, people tend to get more upset and develop their own counter arguments against manipulative information. Um, that's another plus. We're not we're not telling people what to think, and we're not telling them what counter arguments to counter argue. A person who's very logically focused will develop a, a logical counter argument. A person who's um, uh, emotional will have an emotional counter argument. Um, and and that's, that's great. And I'll just wrap up here, excuse me, I'm getting a little uh, dry. All of this is to focus on community resilience. So we don't wanna be either here in our ivory tower or there in the Department of Homeland Security offices down the street, or even um, in the Google offices, um, uh, dropping these interventions uh, down from on high. This is really something um, that has to be undertaken and, and spearheaded um, at the grassroots level. Uh, everyone in a community has a role to play, uh, whether that's the teachers, um, the religious leaders, the babysitters, certainly the parents and the extended family, but people who are really operating at that grassroots level, say the League of Women Voters, uh, everyone has a role to play uh, to increase community resilience and just reduce the, the fertile ground that extremism uh, and political radicalization uh, grows out of. Um, this is a process of education, but it also requires practice. Um, it requires um, uh, leadership showing uh, how you put these ideas into action. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a slogan uh, that I, I heard um, from a, uh, a civil dialogue group. There's a civil dialogue group that does work between a conservative community in Kentucky and a, a liberal um, town in Massachusetts. Uh, and they said, we have um, a motto, which is experts on tap, not on top. Uh, and that has, um, that has guided a lot of our work too. Uh, the community knows what's best for the community. Um, and, and with that in mind, um, you know, I, I would like to just uh, pitch or plug something that we're working on. Um, we're working on a project in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security uh, called the VEER Project, called the Violent Extremism Education and Resilience Project. And what it is, is we're uh, partnering with um, community grassroots organizations, uh, everyone from civil dialogue groups uh, to civil liberties organizations, voting rights groups, um, and so on. And what we're doing is we're developing uh, trainings uh, and resource materials that are ultimately going to empower these groups uh, to uh, create their own inoculation messages and to lead their own um, counter radicalization efforts in their own communities where they really know best uh, what's required. So um, that's, that's my spiel uh, to get us started. If you're interested, um, you can visit our web search, set, excuse me, website, perilresearch.com. Uh, it's still under construction. Uh, academics aren't known for their uh, graphic design. Um, but uh, the important information is there. Uh, and uh, my email is there too, in case anyone um, ever wants to reach out. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop my screen share here. And uh, hopefully we can get into the really fun part here and actually talk. Oh, and look, there's a cat. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you for that presentation. Um, it was very informative. And so I wanted to remind people, and sorry, my cat is, yeah, definitely interested in joining us. Um, 
that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll see how many we can get to. Um, I did see some comments right off the bat in the chat about um, sort of two strands here of vulnerability, you know, who might be susceptible and also about what the role of conspiracy theories is in you know, online extremism or extremism in general or radicalization. So I don't know if you wanted to touch on either of those topics um, and then we might sort of um, answer the specific questions as posed in the chat, but just is there, what, where do conspiracy theories fit into extremism um, and who um, might be vulnerable to them? Yeah, well, conspiracy theories um, overlap with um, extremism, but not all conspiracy theorists are extremists and um, not all extremists are conspiracy theorists necessarily. Um, uh, conspiracy theories appeal to some of those same vulnerabilities that might lead a person towards extremism, uh, the need for easy answers to complex problems or addressing some kind of a grievance. A great many conspiracy theories uh, originate from older um, stories that are very often anti-Semitic in origin. Um, that's just a, a, historical, um, a historical fact. Um, and, uh, also, conspiracy culture is seen by extremists and extremist groups as an excellent place to recruit. Um, they know this as a practical matter just because they try a lot of things out, um, but also they know this uh, in theory, that these are people who are looking for answers who reject uh, the, the mainstream uh, explanation for this or that uh, problem. And they know that uh, that makes them more willing to listen uh, and more more prone to listen to what they're selling. Um, and then I'm sorry, there was a second, or th what was the first one you asked? I think you addressed sort of both um, okay. where conspiracy theories fit in and, and who might be vulnerable to them. Um, but we also had another question about um, sort of vulnerability or radicalization. And that is, um, someone asked here, is it not possible that people can be radicalized not only by personal insecurities, there's the sort of vulnerabilities that you touched on, um, but also by strong connections through family or a social group where the radical ideas are the norm. Um, Absolutely. So I don't know yeah, if you I, want to elaborate on that and how that um, plays out online. Yeah, uh, that, that is absolutely the case. Um, there is kind of a stereotype of an isolated teenager in his bedroom, um, lonely, so he makes friends uh, with the neo-Nazis. Um, that's definitely something that happens. It's a very common um, radicalization pathway. But what is sometimes not appreciated is that social bonds and even love uh, can draw people in these directions. It can be easier to go along with a family member who's radicalizing, especially if it's a parent, you know, and you're a child depending on them, it can be easier to go along with a person that you love uh, rather than do the sometimes very painful work uh, of um, addressing uh, these, these horrible uh, directions that they're heading in. Um, so, so yeah, it isn't just social disconnection that's a problem. Social connection is a problem too. And, you know, I didn't get into it in my talk because, you know, I already went, went over <laughs> the time that I was shooting for. But um, we really do have to think about the way that our history in this country um, has created a precedent for an awful lot of the political radicalization that we're dealing with today. You know, Jim Crow is still living memory. Um, you know, my own, my own parents, uh, you know, so close to Martin Luther King Day. My own parents remember uh, the Jim Crow era. Uh, this, is, this is really something that we carry with us to this day, um, the legacy of racism. Um, it wasn't resolved uh, with the voting. Uh, it wasn't resolved with King's uh, March, March on Washington. Um, so, so that's another element of radicalization. Uh, in some ways, our, our digital um, world has been able to retrieve um, and reintroduce a lot of the, the worst ideas and the worst thinkers from the past uh, to a new generation. Um, all kinds of awful people who were drummed out of the American conservative movement in the years between uh, uh, William F. Buckley kicking uh, the, um, uh, uh, the John Birch Society uh, off the pages of the National Review all the way to uh, the Reagan administration uh, 
distancing itself from um, just virulent racists like Sam Francis, these people are all back in digital form uh, and young people are reading it, um, very young people in some cases. You know, everything on the internet is forever, whether it's your college party picks, you know, or um, uh, your manifesto. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so we have another question here, and maybe this gets into sort of the democracy aspect of this all. Um, someone is asking, practically speaking, um, the League of Women Voters hosts uh, a lot of uh, candidate forums many of them local candidate forums in the months before an election. So does Peril offer any resources that we could have available to guide um, listeners to those forums when candidates veer into extremist language? And I can tell you that we had some forums this fall in Maine where some of the candidates um, participated civilly in the forum, but they definitely expressed things that I wouldn't have expected in terms of their beliefs in extremism. Um, so. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, um, but that's, you know, it's happening. It really is happening all over. Um, Peril doesn't have any uh, resources specifically for um, um, electoral scenarios like what you're talking about. But what we do have and what I would absolutely love to speak with you all about um, either tonight or at some later point this project that I told you about, the Violence and Violent Extremism Education and Resilience Project, what we want to do is we want to provide groups like the League of Women Voters with all of the resources and all of the training um, that would be necessary for you all to develop um, your own resources that you can hand out at your forums or in advance of your forums or you know put on your website or whatever. We have so much science <laughs> to share, but it, in an academic institution, it can be very hard to get it out to the right people. And that's what that DHS grant uh, was really intended to do. It's to get this out of the ivory tower and, and into grassroots groups like yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you wanna speak a little more broadly to since we're on this, threat of democracy. Um, obviously, the League of Women Voters is concerned with the health of our democracy as an organization. So is there anything that your research tells you about how extremism affects sort of the information ecosystem or just generally sort of the societal sort of ecosystem in which um, democracy has to exist? Yeah, um, democracy depends on an informed electorate. Uh, and it depends on um, voters who are able to uh, weigh uh, the, their needs as citizens in a, in a measured and not um, emotionally uh, frenzied kind of way. And what extremist content does is it makes both of those things extremely difficult. Uh, and for some people, it makes it impossible. Um, extremist content is highly emotionally charged. Um, it's very outrageous. And unfortunately, um, many online platforms, especially social media, but cable news isn't innocent of this either. Um, what is the, the most outrageous message is the one that spreads the farthest and the fastest and people engage with it uh, the, the most. So um, in that respect, extremist, um, the, the emotions that extremist content uh, produces are detrimental to, to, to democracy, um, but also in terms of um, producing uh, a high volume of bad information. Um, now, this is an interesting thing um, because it's, it's become a tactic of information warfare. Um, uh, the Russian government uses it against the United States. The Chinese government has used it against the United States. The way that propaganda works nowadays it doesn't involve um, setting up a, a puppet newspaper um, that tells you all the reasons why um, Chairman Xi in China is um, uh, better than uh, President Biden. But what it involves is um, what they call flooding the zone, which means inundating um, your information system with uh, good information 
bad information and nonsensical information. You just throw everything you have um, at the public. And um, it's less important that they believe something false than yeah. that they just give up. And they say, oh, well, who knows? I guess everyone's just a liar. And that drives disengagement. That makes people much less likely uh, to participate in democracy. And um, that's, uh, you know, that's really a unique problem of the digital age that we don't know how to solve yet. Um, you say we don't know how to solve it yet, but the, here's a question asking about a potential solution. So I'd be curious about your opinion because we have ranked choice voting in Maine. Someone asked, do you feel that ranked choice voting can help to reduce the extremist threat? That's a really good question. Uh, I'm a communications uh, scholar by training. My background is in um, new media technology. Uh, so you would probably be better off asking a political scientist uh, about that. But we do know that the two-party system does uh, have some polarizing effects. When your choice is one or the other, um, then, then that can create a very stark divide in people's minds between their party and the other party. Um, but uh, frankly, I would, I would defer to uh, all of your judgment uh, on that question more than my own. I think that um, personally, I'm very interested and we have a few folks from Alaska on this call, um, the system that Alaska has recently adopted with a top four uh, primary and then a ranked choice general election. I'm curious because there is some evidence about the roles that prim party primaries have in our elections in terms of uh, people, candidates go to the extreme during the primaries because that's the cohort of voters who show up for primaries. And that might then lead you with more extremist candidates in general elections. So anyway, uh, for those in Alaska, I'm like interested in following how, how it might look, um, whether or not your candidates get less extreme because of the system you've adopted or not. So I guess yeah. TBD. Um, well, we have another question or two here. Um, we have someone asking, does your university work with, and I'm not familiar with this person, but maybe you are, uh, Booz Hamilton research in this issue? Oh, um, yeah, Booz Hamilton is a, um, a contractor that has a lot of um, government contracts across a, a variety of um, defense uh, and security um, needs. Um, I can't speak for the entire university. American University is, is pretty big. Uh, I can say that our lab doesn't uh, have any contracts or contacts uh, with Booz Hamilton, no. All right. Um, and someone is asking, um, you know, I think some of the recommended readings we'd sent out were about one of them was like a, a guide for parents and other sort of yeah. people interacting with youth on preventing uh, radicalization. But someone asks, are most of your interventions with younger people? Because um, middle aged and older adults also seem to be increasingly radicalized. Yeah, um, they are. Uh, that is, the, in, in the days before the internet, um, the the real key demographic was um, men age um, 15 to 29. Uh, nowadays, we're seeing that radicalization is happening at much older ages and much younger ages. Um, we've had um, people uh, arrested overseas for running uh, violent neo-Nazi um, gangs who are as young as 13 years old. And I don't mean street gangs, you know, fighting uh, with bricks and things like that. I mean, people amassing uh, automatic weapons and, and you know, pre preparing for revolution. Um, so uh, yeah, the age, uh, the age has definitely shifted. Sorry, what was the first part of that question? Oh, you're, you're muted, I think. Oh, <laughs> I was um, just reading it off. Are most of your interventions with younger people was the first part. Oh, right. Um, I, would, I would venture to say it's about half and half. Um, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the work we do that reaches young people, uh, it reaches them um, through uh, an intermediary. It's actually very hard uh, to work with young people uh, in a university setting because we have those high ethical standards um, and you have to have informed consent 
and uh, a child can't give informed consent. Um, they have to um, you know, consult with their parents. Uh, so it, it, as a practical and ethical matter, it, it's really, really difficult. We, we are able to do it sometimes. Uh, so what we do instead is we work with educators and we work with um, uh, faith leaders and uh, we work with um, the, the, what we call secondary caregivers, um, people like coaches and um, youth group leaders uh, and people like that who, who work with uh, young people and we equip them uh, with this knowledge and, and these resources. Uh, that's, that's really how we do it. And I'll say that uh, that recommended reading that we linked to in the event description that you had um, from the Southern Poverty Law Center about a guide for people working with youth was really good. Um, Thanks. So we have a couple more questions. Um, also, we have 10 minutes left, so I don't know um, how many more questions we'll be able to get to, but if anyone has any last minute questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, so we have this question. Uh, Besides the debate about what exactly constitutes disinformation, sort of real news versus fake news, isn't there a tendency in the US and Europe to actually value a more authoritarian form of leadership over democracy or fundament, foundational value? So I think that's a little more philosophical, but getting back to that democracy issue, I don't know if you wanna comment on that. That's, that's a really good question. And that gets at something, very deep, uh, not just about um, not just about our politics, but really about what makes us tick uh, as people. Um, I, I'm not sure I can hazard uh, a judgment, you know, as to whether we innately prefer authoritarianism over democracy. But I think something that that is interesting and that we ought to bear in mind is um, we, we're rightly very concerned about threats to our democracy presently, um, but we need to keep in mind that our democracy um, has only rarely been fully democratic, um, if ever. Uh, the, the rights of women to vote, the rights of African-Americans to vote. Again, these are, these are um, things that um, in some cases within living memory uh, were seriously and even violently prevented. This is before you even get into issues like gerrymandering and redlining and, and things like that. So um, I, I think, I think I, you know, this is an obnoxious thing to do, but I would, I would try to just twist that question a little bit to say, democracy is something that many of us aspire to. And I think it's something that we want to um, convince others to aspire to more. And maybe we've never reached the, um, the ideal of what a democratic United States uh, would really look like. Um, but I think we're closer to envisioning it, uh, if not achieving it uh, today than ever. Yeah, interesting. Um, someone asks, is it mostly boys and men who are attracted to extremism? Um, what is your idea about why that may be? It is. Uh, it is uh, usually boys and men. Um, but don't, um, you know, don't uh, underestimate uh, women's contributions. Uh, women um, historically and today uh, have played really integral roles. Uh, in a lot of very nasty uh, extremist groups. It's just that usually because of the extreme sexism and misogyny of these groups, uh, they aren't allowed to be a, a face of the organization. They're, they're kept uh, behind the scenes, um, but they have really um, done a lot of the, the necessary logistical and support work for um, you know, every group from the, the Ku Klux Klan um, uh, to um, the Islamic State. Um, so uh, as to why, uh, why, are, why are men overrepresented in violent crime? Um, there, there's probably a, a biological component. There's definitely a social component. Um, you know, uh, something uh, else that we can consider um, as we've been doing our research, we've increasingly found that misogyny is integral to um, virtually every extremist point of view and organization uh, that you can that you can name. Any any anything you can research, you'll find misogyny in there. Um, and this is another example of how our perspective on even identifying the problem has prevented us from really addressing it adequately, because. Um, male supremacy, which is what we are calling it now, or misogyny, hasn't been viewed 
uh, as an extremist point of view. Um, but what is the idea that women ought to be subservient to men? What is that other than a stark in-group, out-group distinction that prescribes domination of one group over the other? Um, so we really need to be thinking of that as extremism uh, alongside um, all, the, all the more traditional uh, varieties that you might think of. Yeah, that's an excellent observation. And when you had said that thing earlier about um, you know, the internet um, resurrecting old forms of, of hate and, and bigotry and extremism, I was thinking in my mind um, about the fact that Andrew Tate has been in the news and he's sort of a, yeah. people might have heard of him, sort of TikToker, or influencer, whatever you want to call him, but he really was very like foundational to his sort of brand was misogyny and it just felt very old school and yet he was targeting young men and boys in particular so that point about misogyny being a through line is is really interesting yeah um so we only have a few more minutes um we have one question here this is sort of another deep cut um and then i think i have one other question i'd like to ask before we we finish up um, but this one in the chat is someone who says, I read uh, George Lakoff a lot. Can you speak about frames? Oh, sure. <laughs> I wonder if someone went through a communications program. Um, well, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I won't get too into the weeds uh, about George Lakoff himself. But when we talk about frames, we're talking not just about the way that um, we're, we're not just talking about the content. Uh, of a message, we're talking about the way that it's shaped, the context that it's presented in. And that context um, can be just as manip manipulative as an out and out lie. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm struggling to, to pull on an example here, um, but uh, it, let, let, me, let me talk about it this way. In addition to mis and disinformation, Nowadays, we're looking at something that's called malinformation. Um, and malinformation is uh, a true fact that's presented in a way that's intended to be misleading. I, re I remember an example now. There was a uh, headline on the Drudge Report uh, about a month ago that said something like uh, X percent of vaccinated uh, people um, ha have died. Uh, relative, um, you know, relative to whatever. And when you dug into the numbers, that was technically true. But when you weighted those numbers, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, when you separated out by age, uh, when you separated out by other risk factors, what that statistic actually told you was that being vaccinated meant you were something like 10 times less likely <laughs> to have these awful health outcomes. But the way that it was presented as a shocking revelation um, out of, you know, just plucked out of the actual context of the overall public health picture made it uh, sound as if uh, vaccination was what's, what was causing this problem and, and not what was solving it. So, so that's an example of framing, I think. Uh, yeah. Best I can think of anyway. Um, so I guess in the last few minutes, um, I just wanted to sort of pose this forward thinking question about, you know, we're in a new year, 2023. Um, are we making progress on this issue of extremism and radicalization online? Or is it getting worse? And what do you and, and Peril sort of plan to focus on in the coming year or two? Uh, um, there's a lot. A big question uh, to end us out. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. And you know, actually, because I know people start logging off. It's dinner time. Um, please feel free if you have any questions to email me. I'll, I'll do my best. I'm a little slammed. It might take me a while to respond, but I, I will. I will certainly try to respond. Um, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. Um, a lot of uh, people um, who don't work in this field but who care very much about their community and about their country uh, are becoming active and they are understanding that they have a role to play here um, and that they can do something, uh, that this isn't something that we just have to watch in horror as it happens. Um, we're hearing from more and more people like that every day and it's incredibly heartening uh, in that regard. Um, it's also troubling because there aren't enough resources to go around. 
Um, that's one of the things we're trying to accomplish with the VIR project and DHS is get some of those resources around. Um, and then, um, you know, as far as the broader picture, uh, especially online, uh, I think I think unfortunately things are worse. Um, talking points that you would have to go to some real cesspools to find. Uh, when I began researching this stuff a decade ago, uh, are now being um, spoken by members of Congress. Uh, the sheer volume uh, of propaganda online uh, is greater today than ever. Um, social media platforms are absolutely gutting uh, the teams that are responsible for moderating content and for making sure that their tech innovations aren't misused by extremists as, as a cost cutting measure. Um, so those are all very troubling developments, um, but the grassroots, um, the grassroots concern and desire to get involved, uh, I think gives, gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, well, I know we're up on time. So thank you very much, Dr. Hughes, for taking the time and talking with us um, and for everyone, um, you know, feel free to keep this conversation going. Email Dr. Hughes or email us at the League of Women Voters of Maine. We're, we've been really thinking about this a lot um, and we'll keep, keep the conversation rolling with more topics in the coming months. Um, but thanks everyone for taking the time and uh, have a good night. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Thank you.